If you try to answer that question, when is a function integrable, i.e. Lebesgue integrable, by using the four stages of our opening sequence, well, you'd probably find they weren't much use. In this program, what we want to do is to develop the theme of Unit 4, where we find a more practical way, first of all, of finding out whether a function is integrable, and secondly, of evaluating that integral. Well, First of all, let's see why the four stages of our opening sequence don't help us very much in that problem. Well, the trouble is that this sequence of four stages starts off with simpler functions and develops up to the general Lebesgue integrable function. Now, in practice, that's not what we want. What we want is something like the following. You give me a function, and you ask me to tell, tell you, is it Lebesgue integrable? Well, what would I have to do? First of all, I'd have to, using this method, express it as the difference of two functions, f and g. Then I'd have to show that f could be approximated by an increasing sequence of step functions. And I'd have to do the same for g. And then that would tell me that your function was Lebesgue integrable. And secondly, to evaluate the integral, well, I'd express its integral as the difference of the integral of f minus the integral of g. And the integral of f would just be the limit of the sequence of the integrals of the step functions, and the same for g. So I could do it. But, well, it's very cumbersome. And fortunately, in practice, we don't have to use this four-stage process. And that's because there are a set of conditions which a function can satisfy which ensure that such a function is integrable. And we've got these conditions listed here. The first condition is that the function vanish outside some closed interval from a to b. That is, take the value 0 everywhere, except possibly in the interval from a to b. The second condition we require is that the function be bounded. This ensures that the values don't get too big and also don't get too small. And the third condition we want is that the function be continuous almost everywhere. That is, continuous everywhere, except possibly on a null set. Now, these three conditions together are sufficient to ensure that a function is Lebesgue integrable. To be more precise, they are in fact sufficient to ensure that the function is in L inc. That is, is the limit almost everywhere of an increasing sequence of step functions. And the first problem that we're going to look at in this program is to see precisely why these three conditions ensure that f is in L inc. But if you'll grant me that such a function is Lebesgue integrable for the moment, there is a related problem. How, in fact, do we evaluate the integral of a function satisfying these conditions without, in fact, going back looking for sequences of step functions? Well, you should already have seen the answer to that in the correspondence text. And what it amounts to is you can use all your old techniques of integration, the techniques you learned in M100 and M231, the analysis course. And we'll be saying a little bit about that towards the end of the program. But let's start by looking at the first problem. Precisely why do these three conditions ensure that the function f is Lebesgue integral is in L inc? Let's put in all the details of what we have to do to confirm that f is in L inc. We have to find an increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integrals which converges to f almost everywhere. So our first question, quite precisely, is why do these three conditions assert that such a sequence of step functions exists? Well, um, here's a function. Um, we can check that it obeys Ian's three conditions. First of all, it vanishes outside this finite interval. Secondly, it's bounded. And third, it's continuous, except at these three points, and that's certainly a null set, so it's continuous almost everywhere. Now, how could we go about constructing an increasing sequence of step functions to approximate this function? Well, we'll use the same process that you saw in M100 and M231. Remember, we approximated the area under a curve 
by rectangles which get thinner and thinner. And here we proceed in exactly the same way. We'll approximate f by step functions whose steps get thinner and thinner. For our first step function, we bisect the interval and take two steps through the infimum of f in each half. That is, through the lower bound of f in each subinterval. For the next step function, we bisect again to get four steps through the infimum of f in each quarter. So what we're doing is to arrange that we have the largest step possible under the curve in each subinterval. And so we carry on, producing what looks like an increasing sequence converging almost everywhere to f. Well, it looks like it's doing exactly that. The intervals get smaller and smaller. It looks as if we're getting closer and closer to f. But is this really the right kind of sequence for a general function satisfying the conditions of our theorem? In other words, given f, Satisfying the conditions on the left, does our subdivision process always give us an appropriate sequence of step functions? Let's start with the easiest requirement, this increasing requirement. We can see why this is satisfied if we look again at the transition from the first step function to the second. When we bisect the two half intervals and take the infimum in each quarter, the value of phi 2 in each quarter is either going to stay the same as phi 1 or it's going to increase. It can never decrease because we're taking the infimum of f in each quarter, that is, the greatest lower bound of f in each quarter. And this holds at every stage of the process. So it is increasing, but which of our three conditions has been responsible for this? Well, the point is that at each stage we were taking infima, and these infima increased, they could not decrease. And the reason why these infima exist is because of our second condition, that the function f be bounded. In fact, bounded means bounded above and bounded below but it's only the lower bound which we need to ensure the infimum exists. So bounded below is the condition which ensures an increasing sequence of step functions. Now, what is it that ensures that the corresponding increasing sequence of integrals is also bounded? Well, we want to show that this sequence of integrals is bounded above. And that's true because f is bounded. Well, take uh, an element of the sequence phi n, its integral would be just the sum of the areas of these rectangles. And that area is included in the area of this large finite rectangle. Now it's finite because f is bounded, that means that the height is finite, and f vanishes outside this finite interval so that the base is finite. So we've got two of the conditions on our se sequence of step functions that we wanted. We've got the increasing property, which has come about because our function is bounded. And we've got the condition on the sequence of integrals that that sequence be bounded above. And that came about because of the combination of these two conditions. So this tells us that we have got a sequence of step functions of the right kind, which must therefore converge to some function or other, or at least converge almost everywhere. The really hard part, the bit we haven't yet done, is to show that this sequence of step functions in fact converges almost everywhere to the function f that we started with. And to show that that is so, we have to use this third condition. The third condition tells me that the function is continuous almost everywhere. I want convergence almost everywhere. So this suggests that we try taking a point where the function is continuous and try and show that at that point 
the sequence of step functions converges to the value of the function f. So, given an arbitrary point p at which my function is continuous, can I show that the sequence of step functions approaches closer and closer to the value of the function at that point? Well, let's be a little bit more precise. What I want to show is that given any point p at which the function is continuous and any epsilon greater than zero, can I find a step function phi n which lies within epsilon of function p at that point, and such that all subsequent step functions have their values within epsilon of f of p? Well, I can notice two things. Firstly, none of the step functions is going to go above uh, this curve because they're all constructed from the infima, so they'll all lie below the curve. And secondly, I need only find one step function with, uh, in epsilon of f of p because all the subsequent ones will be even nearer. Remember, I've got an increasing sequence of step functions. So how can I use the continuity of f at p to find one step function whose value lies in here? Continuity at p means that given any epsilon, we can find a positive number delta such that all the points within a distance delta of the point p are mapped by f to within epsilon of f of p. We now choose n so that the width of subinterval for phi n is less than delta. Then the particular subinterval which contains p is thin enough to lie within delta of p. Now the value of phi n at p is the infimum of the values of f in this subinterval. That is, the greatest lower bound of the values of f in the subinterval. And this infimum must be within epsilon of f of p, because the values of f in the whole delta interval are all within epsilon of f of p. So we've got the convergence properties of the sequence of step functions that we wanted, and we've got it from this last condition, the assumption of the continuity almost everywhere of the function f. So what we've got is that these three conditions on the function f ensure that the function must be in L inc, and so in L1. It is integrable. Now, I hope you'll agree that it's somewhat easier to check that a function satisfies these three conditions rather than go through the complicated step function, sequence of step function process that Alan suggested we would have to do at the beginning. And that leads us on to our second problem. We've still got the problem of actually evaluating the integral of a function satisfying these conditions. But before we go on to look at that, there is one point we really must emphasize. This is that these conditions are sufficient. A function satisfying these conditions is Lebesgue integrable. But the converse is by no means true. It's very easy to construct examples which do not satisfy these conditions, but which are still Lebesgue integrable. Well, let's have a look at a couple. Well, as Ian ought to know by now, there is really only one example in this course. It's, it's chi of q, our old friend, the characteristic function of the rationals, uh, which we know, in fact, is Lebesgue integrable, and it's got integral 0. Well, let's see which of Ian's three conditions this obeys or uh, disobeys. Well, the first one is certainly disobeyed. It does not vanish outside any finite interval. No matter how far to the left, or to the right along the real line I go, there are always rational points. And these are points at which chi q has the value 1. So there is no finite interval outside of which this function vanishes. Well, so much for that first condition. The second condition is boundedness. Well, in fact, this function is bounded because it's never greater than 1 or less than 0, so that one is satisfied. What's the third condition? It's continuous almost everywhere. Is chi of q continuous almost everywhere? Well, I think you'll probably accept that it's discontinuous on the rationals because these are points at which it jumps up to 1. Now, if it were only discontinuous on the rationals, that would be all right because the rationals form a set of measure 0. So then it would be continuous almost everywhere. 
But what I'm going to show now is, in fact, that it's discontinuous on the irrationals as well. Now, how do I do that? Well, I'll use this epsilon delta technique. First of all, I have to find an irrational. Well, that's easy enough. There are lots of irrationals knocking about. That looks like an irrational point. And then the formulation of continuity goes as follows. Given any epsilon greater than 0, and I'll take epsilon to be less than 1 just to make things difficult, can I find a delta such that the values of my function for all points within delta of that point are less than epsilon? Well, let's choose this value of delta, make it very small. But in fact, it won't work, because no matter how small I make delta, there will always be rational points in there. Remember, the rationals are dense in the real line. And at rational points, that function has the value 1. So no matter what delta I choose, there will always be values of chi q greater than epsilon. And so I get that chi q is discontinuous at any irrational point. So what have I got? I've got chi q is discontinuous on the rationals, on the irrationals also. In fact, it's discontinuous everywhere. It's not continuous almost everywhere. Well, I suppose we should be thankful for small mercies. At least our function is bounded. But even this last condition can be eliminated as well. This function is unbounded at 0, but it is Lebesgue integrable. It belongs to L inc because we can construct an appropriate increasing sequence of step functions by the process of subdivision we've been looking at. And the sequence of integrals has limit 2. So this function has Lebesgue integral 2. Now, if we add chi of q to g, we get a function which is still Lebesgue integrable with integral 2. And yet it fails to satisfy all three of our conditions. The chi q bit ensures that it doesn't vanish outside a bounded interval and that it's not continuous almost everywhere. And the g bit makes it unbounded on any interval containing 0. So these conditions are sufficient, but not necessary, for a function to be Lebesgue integrable. Well, now let's look at the class of all those functions which do satisfy these three conditions. What we've just said is that this class of functions must be contained inside L1. But what is this class of functions? Well, the conditions weren't chosen at random. And in fact, what it turns out to be the case is that this class of functions is precisely the class of all those Riemann integrable functions, at least Riemann integrable over the interval from A to B. You see, this first condition here is essentially focusing attention on the values of the function on the interval from A to B. And these two conditions tell us that it must, in fact, be Riemann integrable. Now, there is, in fact, a proof of this theorem in Weir, but it is not one of the proofs that we've asked you to look at. In fact, we're not really interested in necessary and sufficient conditions for Riemann integration. We're after Lebesgue integration. But there is one important fact that we do want to draw to your attention from this. And this is from the fact that because these functions are Riemann integrable, we can use all our old techniques of Riemann integration to evaluate them. And what happens is that when we do this, the value of the integral that we get is the same as the Lebesgue integral. Well, let's have a look at the basic reason why this should be so. Because we use the infima of f to define our step functions, each integral is a lower sum in the sense of Riemann integration theory. So the limit of the integrals is, in fact, the supremum of the lower sums, which is the Riemann integral of f. But the Lebesgue integral is, by definition, the limit of the integrals. So the two integrals are equal. So these conditions are extremely useful from two points of view. They give us a wide class of functions which we know immediately must be Lebesgue integrable. And from the practical point of view, they tell us that we can evaluate the integral of these functions using our old Riemann techniques. Now, there is a, a class of functions that we shall come across quite often, and these are the piecewise continuous functions. And these satisfy all three of these conditions, in particular, 
the set of points where they're not continuous or only finite in number, or at least when we're only looking at a closed interval. And so these set of points form a null set, and so they are one of these functions. And what we shall find is that we can compute the integral of these functions in precisely our old way, and then interpret the result that we get as being the Lebesgue integral of that function. Aha, I hear skeptical voices saying, what's the use of Lebesgue integration when nearly every time we have to evaluate an integral, we use the Riemann integral? Well, for practical integration, it's true, it's not much use. But we're not primarily practical men, we're mathematicians. Now, when you uh, look at the convergence properties of the Lebesgue integral later on in the course, you'll see that spaces constructed from Lebesgue integrable functions have this beautiful property of completeness, that is, the limits of sequences of such functions lie within the space, such as the real numbers have. Now, that's not a property which the Riemann integrable functions have, but it's very important from a theoretical point of view. And we're not so much interested in evaluating the integral of the limit of such a sequence, but in knowing that the integral of the limit exists. Well, in this program, what we've shown is that from the point of view of practical integration, the Lebesgue integral is at least as powerful as the Riemann integral. But what I'm saying is that in addition, it has this beautiful theoretical property, this property of completeness. And that is the property that makes it invaluable in applications. In fact, that's why we've chosen to devote a whole course to the Lebesgue integral.